Would you take God's word tonight? Please open to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're doing a study in Hebrews on Sunday night, talking about the heroes of faith in the uh, Old Testament that are listed here in Hebrews chapter 11, that it might inspire us and hopefully our faith will grow and be challenged as we look at these men and women. And so Hebrews 11 is all about faith, and the writer is exhorting the readers of that day um, and us today to live by faith. Uh, Why? Well, faith is the only way you can approach God. Faith is the only way you can please God. And the writer was addressing people who believed that they could approach God by religious works and rituals. Remember, first century Judaism uh, was really an apostate form of Old Testament Judaism that taught that you can come to God by works, you can earn your way uh, uh, to God through uh, effort and ceremony and works and morality and all those sorts of things. But the writer of Hebrews is reminding them that, no, it's only faith. Faith is the only way you approach God, and faith is the only way you please God. Faith and faith alone. And as we had pointed out before in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, just before you get to uh, chapter 11, the writer quotes from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, where he says, Uh, The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And so he goes to the Old Testament to show that this principle of approaching God by faith and living by faith is nothing new. It is taught in the Old Testament. Uh, We uh, now, in our day, we get saved by looking back to the cross. But in the Old Testament, they got saved by looking forward to the cross. But it's all by faith. And just to prove that coming to God by faith was not a new concept, the writer of Hebrews then goes all the way back to the beginning in the, in, in the book of Genesis, and he begins to kind of work his way through the Old Testament and mention characters that were very well known and how that they all had a life of faith that pleased God. It, it, didn't, it wasn't that they had a life that was perfect because a lot of these individuals were flawed sinners, and yet they had a faith in God. They trusted God. They approached God by faith. We looked at Abel. Abel teaches us the way of faith. We enter the Christian life by faith. We looked at Enoch. Enoch talks uh, talks to us about the walk of faith. We walk daily with God by faith, and because of that, God rewards us. But now we look at Noah tonight in verse number 7 of Hebrews chapter 11, and Noah teaches us about the warning of faith. We take God's warning seriously, and we live in the fear of the Lord. We live in fear of his word and what his word says regarding judgment. And he gives us just really one short verse here about the life of Noah. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, as, or, uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So the writer doesn't really elaborate on the whole story of Noah. He just kind of... Uh, talks about the flood. Why? Well, because, again, he was writing to Hebrews who knew this Old Testament. They knew the book of Genesis. They knew the story, and they believed it. The problem is today we have all kind of people that laugh at the story of Noah and the ark. A lot of people don't believe in the story of Noah and the ark. Uh, Recently, I heard about people who have claimed they spotted the ark. In fact, uh, I did some archaeology in Israel, and there were some men over there in the dig that actually went to uh, to the Mount Ararat to, to uh, look for the ark. <laughs> I don't think they found it, but they at least made an effort. They invited me to go, and I said, I don't think so. Uh, I'll just let you guys find it, and you tell me everything you saw. Send me the pictures. Um, but nevertheless, there has been a lot of documentaries done about uh, sightings there in Mount Ararat. Books have been written about it. And, uh, but really, we don't need the evidence to believe the story of Noah's ark. I don't really need that evidence. Why? Well, because I believe the written record of God's Word. There's nothing more solid than the Word of God and what the Bible says. We know it happens because, happened because the Bible says it happened. The biblical account of Noah's Ark is a, is a story of a universal flood that God poured out upon that, uh, that world, the antediluvian age, because of their sin. It's not a myth. It's not a children's bedtime story. It is historical fact. Flood traditions, did you know that flood traditions can be found in every civilization uh, in the world, really? Dr. Richard Andy collected 46 flood legends from North and South America, 20 from Asia, 5 from Europe, 7 from Africa, 10 from the South Sea Islands and Australia. And so what are these? These are stories about a flood and about a man who built a big boat 
and, and carried animals on the boat. Now, all these stories, they, they differ a little bit, but they have the, the same major theme, uh, which is an, a flood and a boat and animals and a family that were on board this, this boat and saved them. Scientifically, marine fossils have been found atop mountains, seashells, and some of the highest places. I, I've told you before, I, I, was, uh, I went uh, through the Grand Canyon with Anchors in Genesis on a, on a seven-day trip through the Grand Canyon, and we went with some geologists and and, uh, and, and looked at a lot of the rock formations. Of course, they were teaching and training me. I didn't know anything about what I was looking at. But they were there instructing and saying, look, here's how this layer got here. But we also were able to go way high on some of those cliffs there in the, in the Grand Canyon, and they pointed out and showed me marine fossils that were encased in rock. How did they get there at those levels, at those heights? Seashells and, and marine fossils were there. Uh, how did they get there? And again, they were pointing out evidence in the Grand Canyon of a universal flood. But then biblically, we, the, again, the Bible verifies this. The prophets in the Old Testament verified it. For example, write down Isaiah 54, 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. Here is the prophet Isaiah speaking the word of God and affirming that this flood did happen. And then if that's not enough, we have the words of our Lord Jesus, which is, is enough. And Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and that is enough for me, along with what God's Word says. Now, there are modern experts who love to swagger and talk about advanced technology and say, how could Noah build an ark that didn't sink? He didn't have our technology well, I would just remind those men that Noah didn't need uh, advanced technology. By the way, the Titanic was built by, prof- uh, by, built by professionals. And the, uh, Noah's Ark was built by an amateur, but it was an amateur who was listening to the instructions of Almighty God. All he had to do was just listen to what God said. God knew perfectly well how to build an ark that would float. And so uh, he knew how to trust God. I like to say that Noah had an unsinkable faith. So let's look at verse 7 and look at some of the characteristics of the faith uh, that Noah had that we should have. First of all, just write down, number one, the warnings that faith believes. The warnings that faith believes. In verse 7, again, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. So God warned Noah about this coming judgment. And really, again, this is the foundation of all faith. What is it? It is faith in what God says, faith in the revelation of God. Noah had never seen a flood. In fact, Noah had never seen rain. Before the flood, there was no rain. There was not four seasons. The earth kept a perfect temperature. Genesis 2, verses 5 and 6, 5 and 6 tells us that there was a mist that went up out of the earth and watered the whole face of the earth, the Bible says. Many scholars believe that there was a great canopy over the earth that kind of maintained the temperature of the earth, kind of like one giant greenhouse. But all of that was about to change. God promised that it was going to rain and a flood would destroy the inhabitants of the earth. So Noah was warned about something that he had never seen seen or had heard of before, and yet he believed what God said. Even though he couldn't see it, even though maybe it was hard for him to fathom, he believed God. He believed the Word of God. What does the Bible say? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot have faith unless you have the Word of God. Faith is always based on what God says. It's not a leap into the dark. It's a leap into the light. It's a leap into the light of God when God makes clear what he's going to do. It's not name it and claim it. No, it is believe it and receive it because God named it. You're not the one naming things. God is the one naming things. And when he names it, we can claim it by faith. 
And that brings us back again to the definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Uh, and so uh, faith uh, is, has such substance to it that you believe what God says so much that even though it's invisible, it makes that future in, invisible thing, it makes it a present reality. Faith has substance to it. It's anchored in what God says. Faith makes the future unknown a present reality. It sees it. Now, people don't believe a lot of the warnings that they're given today. In fact, uh, we preach all the time, as I'm one of many thousands of preachers across this land, that warn people about the judgment of God. That if you don't get your heart right, if you don't repent of your sin, you face a eternal judgment that is more horrible than we can even conceive in our mind. And yet people don't seem to really take warnings serious when they're given from the Word of God. But Noah did when he was warned of God about things not yet seen. The Bible says that he did what? He moved with fear. This is what I call the fear of faith. The foundation of faith is hearing the Word of God, and then there is the fear of faith. He moved with fear. You see, faith in God should move our hearts to reverential fear. When God says something, I believe it, especially when it's about judgment and it should cause us to fear in our heart. Jonathan Edwards, in his treatise concerning religious affections, said that true religion, in great part, consists in holy affections. And he means the, that genuine religion is not just a matter of the head, it's a matter of the heart. It should move our heart. It should have a, an effect on us. It should bring great love when we think about the mercy of God. It should bring great fear when we think about the judgment of God. But again, you want to know what's wrong with this generation? There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God. Isaiah, excuse me, is uh, Ecclesiastes 8.13. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. And that, again, is a warning. And I think that uh, people are in danger of judgment uh, because of their sin, and they don't feel the need to repent, and they don't fear God. And they laugh at the idea of judgment. But, friend, you can rest assured when God speaks about his judgment on sin, you can rest assured it will happen. It will happen. People should be afraid. They should be quaking in their boots about, uh, and with this idea of the judgment of God upon sin. But instead, we have people laughing. We have people not taking things serious. Uh, we have people that, you know, don't treat the Word of God and, and worship serious. And uh, in 1969, in uh, Mississippi, a group of people were preparing to have what they called a hurricane party in the face of a storm named uh, Camille. Or is it Camilla? I don't know. It was one of those anyway. Pretty bad hurricane back in that time. And they were given all these warnings. And yet they laughed. They laughed at the warnings. Um, in fact, this article goes on to talk about the, the chief of police who went to this group of people that had stayed or were having a hurricane party in the face of this hurricane that was coming. And they were in an apartment complex that was about 250 feet from the beach. And the apartments were in the direct line of the danger. And the chief of police yelled up to these people and said, look, you need to clear out of there as quickly as you can because you're right in the path of this storm. But they laughed. And one of them said, this is my land. If you want me off, you have to come and arrest me. They were having a big party. Well, the chief of police didn't arrest anyone, but he did get their names so that he could tell the next of kin what happened to them when the storm hit. And as he was getting their names, they were laughing. But they had been warned, and they had no intention of leaving. It was 1015 when the front wall of the storm came ashore, and scientists clocked the hurricane at a speed of the winds of the hurricane of, of a speed of 205 miles per hour, the strongest on record. When the raindrops hit, the report said they were, had the force of bullets. And needless to say, 
Hours later, there was nothing left of that whole apartment complex. It was gone. And all those people were gone. And I read that story, and I thought, you know, that's just a picture of our society today. They've been warned, constantly warned about the coming judgment of God, and yet they laugh, and they're having a party, and they're living it up, and they don't really take to heart the warnings that God gives about repenting and being prepared for the storm of judgment that is going to come one day. But when Noah was warned, the Bible says he moved with fear. He moved with fear. He believed God's word. He believed the judgment was coming, and he moved with fear. And notice what it says, and prepared a heart, an ark to the saving of his household. You see, uh, a fear of God should move us to believe God's word and then to have a fear of God should move us in the way that we live so much so that our family sees that and our family believes as well, and we're able to bring salvation to our household. So there's the warnings that faith believes. And here's number two. Write this down. There's the works that faith achieves. Again, in verse 7 where it says, He prepared an ark to the saving of his household. So not only does Noah believe, and not only does it cause fear in his heart, but he takes the next step. He begins to prepare an ark. Incredible task. You hear about, you know, sometimes I read about people who build a, a fishing boat in their backyard. Noah was going to build an ocean liner in his backyard. And this wasn't going to be a weekend hobby. This was an all-consuming project for 120 years where he was investing his whole life into this. Noah had, uh, had to translate his faith into what Eugene Peterson called a long obedience in the same direction. He, he believed what God says, and he began working on that ark day after day, year after year. Think about it, for 120 years. That's believing. That's faith. You see, the Bible teaches that faith has three elements to it. There's a, a mental aspect of it, theologians called notia. There's a, an emotional aspect to it uh, called ascentious. And then there is a volitional aspect to faith called fiducia. It is a fiduciary commitment of the will. All three elements need to be present for there to be that dynamic faith. And Noah, he believed in his mind everything that God said. It moved his heart with fear, and then it also moved his hands and his feet, and he began building that ark. That is the sign of genuine faith when you, uh, it, it, when you, it changes the way you live. You begin to work towards that thing that you believe. And again, because of that, Noah's faith led to the saving of his whole household. You see, our family needs to see our faith in us. You say, how do they see it? By what we do, how we live, the works that we do. Uh, they need to see our commitment. And that way, when we warn them about the coming judgment, they'll take it serious. That's what Noah did. Think, contrast Noah with Lot. Remember the story of Lot? Lot's one of the most miserable creatures in all of the Bible, yet he was a saved man because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that he was a just man, and yet he lived a miserable life, and you can read about Lot in Genesis chapter 19. He lived in Sodom, the most vile, wicked city on the face of the earth at that time. And, he, and, and at first he pitches his tent towards Sodom, and then he goes and he lives in Sodom, and then he ends up becoming a judge at the gate of Sodom. He kind of uh, fellowship with those people there, and then he got put in a political position there. He got elected to an office there in Sodom. And God told Lot, God warned Lot, just like he warned Noah, that he's going to overthrow. God said, I'm going to destroy this place. And he, of course, you know the story. He said that through the angels that he sent there. And the message from God was, get out, get your family out, because I'm going to destroy this place. Just like God warned Noah, God warned Lot. And the Bible says that Lot, this backslidden, miserable Christian, went and told his sons-in-law, and you know what they did? They laughed at him. They laughed at him. They mocked him. You know why? Because they saw the way he lived. They saw his life. And his life did not match the message that, they were, that he was giving them. And yet, Lot was able to get his wife, even his wife he had to drag out. And she was so filled with the, uh, the worldliness of Sodom that she looked back longing. And the, what does the Bible say? She was turned to a pillar of salt. And, of course, you know how that story ends 
It's a sordid story of how Lot ended up living in a cave with his daughters and committing incest. It's just a horrible, horrible story. Here's a man that got a warning from God, and yet he lived in such a way that when he issued that warning to others, they would not believe. Friend, we, I, we need to be more like Noah and believe what God says and believe it so much that it affects the way we live every day of our life. People see our faith. They see it in the way that we live. So there's the warnings that faith believes. There is the works that faith achieves, but also write down number three, there's the wickedness that faith perceives. Look again in verse 7, where it says, by which he condemned the world. He moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household, by the which he condemned the world. Noah is a man that lived in a terribly wicked society. Friend, don't tell me you can't live for God in a wicked world. You can. If, if Noah can do it, then we can do it. Noah is proof that we can live for God in a wicked world. Faith gives you the ability to overcome the wickedness of the world. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We might have a wicked society today, but I would say that it probably wasn't as bad. As bad as it is now, it wasn't as bad as it was in Noah's day. Listen to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here the human race was created in the image of God, and sin spoiled that image, and now man is so corrupt, so depraved. And here, I think this verse says that man in that day, they're living out the full measure of their depravity. Every thought in their heart had the intention of committing evil and fashioning evil. That's really the, the word there, like a potter would fashion clay. There were people back there living and thinking about evil all the time and thinking about how they can fashion, out, fashion and work out this evil that they planned in their heart. And God saw that the earth was so wicked. And uh, again, we see the phrase in Genesis 6, and God saw, and God saw. He was watching. And uh, there was another thing. The, the people back in that day, while they were living in all their wickedness, here was Noah, believing God, building an ark, and people would see that. It wasn't a secret. They, they thought Noah was crazy building an ark, talking about rain, a flood that no one had ever seen before. But that very work of building that ark condemned the world. It condemned them. That ark, I think people at first when Noah was building that thing, they hated that to see that thing because it was a constant reminder to them of the coming judgment of God that they laughed at. And yet that ark and the works of Noah condemned the world in that day. It was a constant testimony of what God was going to do. They saw the righteous life of Noah. They saw his works. I don't think that Noah walked around with a, a, a holier-than-thou attitude. I think that Noah knew that he was a sinner saved by the grace of God, but it was just his life of obedience and a constant warning, telling people what God told him and preparing for that. That's what condemned that world in that day. Because everyone in that world that saw the life of Noah and saw what he was doing had to make a decision to believe God or to reject the message of God. And, of course, we know the story. There was only eight people that got on board that ark, and that was Noah and his family. As Christians, we should never display a judgmental spirit towards the world because we know, except by the grace of God, there go I. But we should walk in the light, and, we sh and people should see our righteousness. And, and they should know that the, the God is real by what they see in us. So there is the warnings that faith believes. There's the works that faith achieves. There's the wickedness that faith perceives. But here's finally the last thing, the wealth that faith receives. Look again in verse 7 at the last part where it says, by, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So what was Noah's legacy? It was righteousness. He was made righteous in the sight of God. And that, and that is, he believed God's word. Again, the just shall live by faith. 
And the revelation that God gave to Noah, he believed it. And God said, that faith right there is enough faith to save you. Faith in the revealed word of God. Again, Noah got saved the same way that anybody gets saved. By faith in what God's word says. Faith in looking forward to the sacrificial death of the Messiah, the innocent one that was going to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a man who believed what God said. He believed it was true. And he lived it out in his life. And another thing that we can learn from the story here is this this ark is really a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, would you just take your Bibles uh, as we kind of finish up, but go to Genesis chapter 6, and let's look at Genesis 6. It's a beautiful picture in Genesis 6 of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want you to see it. Look at verse number 14. Here's God's word to Noah in verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cupid. And thou shalt finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. And so here's God's directions to Noah. And, uh, and then uh, God tells him, uh, look in verse number 22. Let's just drop down at the end. Thus did Noah, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And so, again, this whole story is a beautiful picture and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know that? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter refers to the ark as a anti-tupos, is the Greek word he uses there, which is where we get our word type. And it is a type of uh, salvation. It is a type of uh, in fact, 1 Peter, just let me give you the verse, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few that his eight souls were saved by water, the like figure, there's the word, the anti-tupas, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what's Peter saying there? He's saying that that ark is a type of Christ. And just like Noah and his family were placed into the ark, when you are placed into Christ, you are saved. When he talks about the baptism, he's not talking about water baptism there. In fact, there's a lot of people that use that passage in 1 Peter 3 to try to say water baptism saves. You know, again, where uh, Peter says um, that uh, we're in... Uh, baptism doth now also save us. Eight souls were saved by water, it says. And actually, the, the Greek um, preposition there can be, is die, or we could say saved through water. Uh, Noah and his family weren't saved by water. Water would have killed them. In fact, water killed everyone else. No one was saved by water back then. But Noah and his family were saved through the water, How were they saved through the water? Well, they were placed inside the ark. That's the point there. And the only baptism that Peter is referring to there is the being immersed inside the ark. That's spiritually what happens when you get saved. You are placed into Christ. And so the whole ark is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you get saved, you are put in Christ. And you know what? If you're in Christ, you know what that means? That means you're safe from judgment. You're safe from the judgment. That's the whole point there. And in verse 14 where it says, pitch it within and without with pitch, the Hebrew word there is kapar. It means a covering. Seventy times that word is translated atonement. Donald Gray Barnhouse uh, said that um, uh, Leviticus 17.11 might read as, it is the blood that serves as a pitch or atonement for your souls. And so, the tar was really basically put all over that ark, and why was it done, done, done that way? Well, it was to keep all the water out. 
uh, they, it was covered with pitch. And the idea is, is that once you're in Christ, guess what? You're, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ covers you, from all, and you're safe from all judgment because you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And another thing about the ark, as we read, that um, only two openings on the ark. There was a side door, and there were some windows at the top. And Noah and his family got on board in that ark. God shut the door. And they could look up through that window. That was a ventilation. And the whole point there is that, you know, the way we, we approach God, the way we look to God is when we are in Christ. You see, that's the idea. And Noah and his family were sealed in that ark. Again, this tells me that uh, is a picture of how our security. You can't lose your salvation. You can fall down in the ark, but you can't fall out of the ark. You're safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also the shape of the ark. Did you know that the dimensions of the ark is the dimensions of a, just a box? I mean, I know we have a lot of um, people that, you know, picture a boat, and, and, I, and I understand that. But if you really look at the dimensions, it's really just a, a, a box. Uh, someone said it, one scholar said it's really the dimensions of an ancient coffin. When you looked at the, the ark, it was just a giant coffin. It wasn't really designed to sail. It was simply designed to float. And I think, when I think about that, I think of the fact that, you know what? As a believer, when we are placed into Christ, you know what? We die to the old world. When Noah and his family got on board that ark, they died to that old pre-flood world. And when they got off that ark, they resurrected unto a new life. And that's the way it is with a believer. We come to Christ, we're placed in Christ, we die to the old world. We are dead with Christ, we are buried with Christ, but also we are raised with Christ, just like the ark uh, later would be on top of Mount Ararat. Um, and by the way, on the, on the day that it landed there, if you look in the Bible, the Bible tells us that, uh, and, and write down Genesis 8, verse number 4, the seventh month on the Jewish calendar is April. The first is October. So the ark rested on Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month. That is three days after the Passover, three days after the crucifixion. That's the same day when Jesus came out of the grave. So it's really, to me, a picture of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We died with Christ. We were buried in, with him. We rose with him. Just like Noah and his family were one with that ark, even so we are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of that is a beautiful picture of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the picture of the ark. Then there's the provision of the ark. You know what? Something about this ark, you know, it wasn't Noah's idea. It was God's idea. Noah didn't come to God and say, hey, you know, God, I think we should build an ark since judgment's coming. It wasn't Noah's idea. It was God that said, here's what you need to do. You know what? Salvation is not man's idea. It's God's idea. Our salvation comes all from God. True salvation is not man reaching to God. It is God reaching down to man. And then there's the invitation. Look in, look in Genesis 7. Look in verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, this is beautiful here, verse 1, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteousness before, righteous before me in this generation. And so God graciously invites Noah and his family to come on board the ark. And you know what that reminds me of? God is graciously inviting people today to come to Christ. Even though the warning is out there for judgment, the invitation is also there. God says to the world today, come, come on board the ark. God graciously invites people to come to Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say go. Go on board the ark. But what? Come. What does that imply? God's there with them. God's on board that ark with them. Come thou and all your family on board this ark. You know what my biggest prayer of my whole life is? If I can just get me and my family and some friends, as many people as I can on board the ark, I'll be a happy man and, and be safe from the judgment that is coming. If I can just get my family and friends on board that ark. And then there's one more verse I want you to see before we close. 
Again, verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And you know what? That's what we need to do. We just need to do what God says. We need to do what God says. That's obedience. That is the sign of a true believer. A true believer is someone who simply wants to obey God, obey the word of God. Then finally, there's the protection of the ark. God promised to save Noah and his family and all those that were on board. We see that in verses 19 and 20 here in uh, Genesis chapter 6. And again, once they got on board that ark, they were safe. They could fall down in the ark, but they couldn't fall out of it. They were safe. They were secure. They were sealed in that ark. That's the safest place to be. The safest place to, for us to be is to be in Christ, obeying what God tells us to do. That is unsinkable faith. Let, let's bow for prayer together tonight. Let's bow for prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to, again, examine your own heart according to what we see here about the life of Noah. How is your faith? Are you, are you living out your faith? Do other people see it in your life? Are you certain of your own salvation? Are you sure you're on board the ark? Are you certain of that? And then are you living out what God says in his word. And friend, if you're not certain of your salvation, I encourage you to put your faith in Christ right now. Right now. Don't wait. Greatest thing you could ever do is to make certain of your own salvation. The safest place to be in this world is to be in Christ. To be in Christ. Father, thank you again for this beautiful reminder of faith in the life of one of your great, great servants. Help us, Lord, to take it all to heart. Help us, Lord, to emulate the the life of this great saint of God. May we, Lord, also live with reverential fear, believing your word, believing that judgment is coming. And we need to get busy working. We need to warn others so that they can take heed and be safe from that coming judgment. Lord, help us. Lord, help us to get all of our friends and family on board the ark. Use our life of faith to bring others to faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.